for gathering us here this morning where we can confess our sins and receive your forgiveness. We can sing hymns of glory, honor, and praise to you, and we can hear your word proclaimed. Heavenly Father, as we live in such a chaotic world where we're always on the run from one thing to another, let us simply spend time with you, hearing your word, hearing you speak, hearing you guide our lives. And Father, may we pursue that. And Father, when we don't, may we understand and know that you are always pursuing us. May we understand that we are like the prophet Jonah, who no matter how many times he messes up, you still have a plan and a purpose for him. Father, and that means you have a plan and a purpose for us. We ask all that in your son's precious name. Amen. Last week, we started this new series, Jonah Called Into a World Against God, and in doing that, we saw a couple things. One, we saw that this book is a different kind of book about prophecy. With all the other prophets, it's usually about the word that comes to them and then how they're supposed to go and tell that word. Here in this book, Jonah receives word to go to Nineveh and to preach against the wickedness that's there. And this book has to still do with that word. But what this book has to do more with is telling us about the prophet himself, the prophet Jonah. And what we see when we go through this, and we have to be careful, we don't see that this is a self-help book. We don't see that, oh, Jonah did this, so therefore we have to do that. This doesn't look at us, and we can't go into this book with this understanding of, I have to be better than Jonah. What we have to do when we read this book is we have to say what I ended the sermon with last week, the words that I am Jonah. And that's shocking to us. And, and this whole book has shocking things in it. And I spent the majority of last Sunday and Saturday, or Sunday, telling about all the shocking things we see in chapter 1. And I'm going to be honest, in chapters 2, 3, and 4, there are still plenty of shocking things that are going to happen that we're going to unravel through the next uh, few weeks. But today, where I want to start off with is where we ended with last time, the 17th verse of chapter 1. And this is what it says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. We're going to come back to those words that the Lord provided the fish. And then it says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We have to remember that this man of God was running away from God. He tried to do everything he possibly could to get away from the call that was put on his life. Not only is it shocking that he was doing this, not only was it shocking that he got thrown overboard, not only was it shocking that he's in the belly of the fish, but this story is shocking because it tells us a lot about who we are as people. This story is shocking because it tells us exactly what we need and where our dependence should be. And the story is shocking because God continues to choose us. Jonah has a series of steps in which he continues to mess up. And he makes these conscious decisions throughout this. He receives God's call. And then what does he do? Instead of going east, he goes as far west as he possibly can. He goes and he pulls out his money and he buys a, a ticket to get onto the boat. That's a conscious decision. And then he makes a conscious decision to, to not stay up with all the other sailors, but to go down into one of the rooms and to sleep. And then he makes a conscious decision that says, you know what? I know what's going to solve all your problems. Stop throwing everything overboard and instead throw me overboard. That not only gets rid of your problems, but that's going to get rid of my problem. And just for a split second, we are left there in Jonah chapter 1, verse 16, before we get to this verse. And it made me think of a story. And as I, I was reading what other people have read this, written about this, the story came up numerous times, and I figured it's good to share. The story is about a young native brave who's coming of age. And on the night when appropriate, 
decided by the father and decided by the tribe, this young brave was taken out into the deep, dark, dense forest. And he was to spend the whole night there all by himself, all alone. And in doing this, it's something he had never done before. He had never been away from his parents like this before. He'd never been away from the tribe like this before. And so a blindfold was put over his eyes. And he was led miles into this forest where at a certain point, after people had left, he would be able to take this blindfold off. One author, he goes on to say something like this. Just think. Put yourself in this young, brave shoes. Just think. Every time a twig snapped, he probably visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. Every time an animal howled, he probably envisioned a wolf leaping out of the darkness ready to attack him. Every time the wind blew, he wondered what more sinister sound that wind was masking. No doubt it had to be a long and terrifying night for the young brave. And after what seemed like an eternity, those first rays of sunlight would start hitting these pockets of the dense forest. And he would be able to open his eyes and he would be able to see maybe some of the plants. He'd be able to see the trees He'd even be able to see the beaten path that he walked to get to the place where he's at. Now in his utter astonishment, as he was turning his body and his head to look around, he saw the uh, figure of a man standing there with a bow and arrow in hand. This man was his father. And his father had been there alongside him all night long protecting him. Just like Jonah, God was always there every step of the way. Just like the brave, his father was there every moment through the night. And for us, what we have in common here, we have a heavenly father who wants to protect us, who wants to pursue us, and who chooses us every single moment of every single day. So just like Jonah, now he's in the belly of the fish. Probably not as excited as the character there. Just like the brave, he is all alone. And for us, in our faith journey, we're going to look at three practices today that we can do. And in our faith journey, we need the practice of confinement. And the practice of confinement to a lot of us is something that is scary. I don't like sitting idle. I don't like a full day where we just sit at home. I get antsy. I want to be on the move. I want to do something. Because too often when we have this downtime, when the world begins to quiet down around us and we can just pause for a few minutes, we think that something is wrong. We think that we always have to be on the go. We think we always have to be doing something moment after moment until we fall asleep. We think that the world is going to provide some kind of rest for us, and, and that's a lie because the world never provides rest for us. The world wants us to keep going and going. That's why we have nicknames for cities in the U.S., like the cities that never sleep. We're always told that we have to be doing something and pursuing something, that, that quiet time or time to pause, it, it's not good for us. When in reality, some quiet time, so, some time to pause, some time to reflect, it's actually really refreshing for us. Because when we are in that moment of confinement, just as Jonah is in this moment of confinement in the belly of the whale, we get to experience something. We get to experience a private sanctuary with our God. Just think, as we turn into chapter 2, these words are spoken, are written, I mean, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Jonah had spent so much time running, so much time thinking about this problem that he's creating, so much time trying to forget who God is and what God called him to do, that he doesn't have time to just sit and pause. And in the moment when he does, it says that he prayed to the Lord his God. 
The private sanctuary that Jonah has right now is inside the belly of this fish. Here he is receiving protection. Because if we are normally thrown overboard, we don't last very long. And yet the belly of the fish is a place of protection for Jonah. He receives time with God without distraction from the world. And only inside the belly of the fish does Jonah realize he needs a total dependence on God. He says this, in my distress, as my life was in complete turmoil, as I, as I was ready for it all to be over, I called to the Lord and he answered me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, but yet again, this total dependence, but yet I will look again to your holy temple. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. Somebody said earlier this week, when we hit rock, uh, nobody ever told me that rock bottom had a basement. And that's really resonated with me this week. Because sometimes when we have rock bottom, we're still looking around and we're still looking up. We're looking for all those uh, uh, distractions to save us. But yet when we're in the basement of being in rock bottom, we have nowhere else to look. Jonah was in the basement of rock bottom inside the belly of the fish. He had nowhere else to look but to his God. And also our time in this private sanctuary, it's time where we can give shouts of praise. Jonah says this in verse 9, But I, with shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. So something for us to think about throughout this week as we're reflecting on Jonah chapter 2. I encourage you to pick up these study guides as well. They're for personal and as well group discussion, and, and there's plenty available is where is your private sanctuary? Where is the place where you encounter the living God? Where are you free from distractions to, to simply focus and, and, and your full focus, your full attention in the presence of the Lord? Your full attention on the word of the Lord. Your full attention on what he is calling you to do. Where is the place, where is your private sanctuary where you are willing to submit to the Lord to be a Jonah and to proclaim that salvation comes from the Lord? To many of you, this looks like a beat up 2003 two door, two wheel drive Ford F-150. To me, this was my private sanctuary. I had some family help me get this truck as I was going through a time of just financial trouble and, and car trouble. This, car's actually from, this truck is actually from Alabama. My mom drove it up here so I could have a car to get through and then I made payments to my brother and sister-in-law through this. There was a couple issues with this truck though. One of the main issues with this truck is it had no radio. And it was too expensive for me to get the radio fixed or put a new one in there. So I drove this truck for years without a radio. The, the cassette player that was in it, that was broken too. So I couldn't even go buy cassettes to listen. So it, it, it was a time of just peaceful tranquility and quietness in the cab of this truck. It also had no Bluetooth because it was, it was old. It had no capabilities where I could play the music over uh, my phone and, and connect it that way. There, there was no ways to make phone calls and, and to have it go over, so I was driving safely. Uh, you know, it just had nothing in it but me, a seatbelt, and a steering column. This was my private sanctuary. When I, I used to live off 72nd and Seward, so traveling around from there, spent numerous times at a lot of red lights uh, driving through there. Uh, on, uh, when I got married, we lived on 168th and 370, so I spent a lot of time on 370, on I-80, and on 680 just to get here. And this was my private sanctuary. This is where the joys happened. I remember dropping off Alyssa after our first date, and I I knew that she was going to go on a second date with me. 
And I praised God and gave God thanks as I drove from 168th and 370 to 72nd and Seward. It's my private sanctuary where sorrows happened. I remember the news. I remember where, exactly where I was. It was right after College World Series game, right over here at Eggers Plaza when I got the phone call that my grandpa had died. The one man in my life who had always been there. And I remember as I drove back to our apartment, the tears that were shed, the anger that was spoken out, and the praise that was given as I drove on the way home. So where is your private sanctuary where you can have these joys, where you can have these sorrows, but where you can remember your God and spend time with your God? While in his confinement, while he was in the belly of the fish, Jonah had time of communion. And this is our second practice. In our faith journey, we need the practice of communion. And I'm not just talking about coming up in here and, and eating the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior. That is important too. But communion of being in his word. Communion of, of praying and communicating with him and, and sitting there and waiting for him to speak to you. Jonah had this time, and we need this. And, and it's amazing as we read through the second chapter, we see all the correlations to different psalms that the prophet was using. In, in verse 3, he says, You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers, they swept over me. We look at this uh, verbiage in Psalm 42, verse 7. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I said in uh, verse 4, I have been banished from your sight. Psalm 31, 22. In my alarm, I said, I am cut off from your sight. In verse 5, the engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. And in Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. He continues throughout this second chapter, this prayer that he has, quoting the Psalms at least seven times. For us, it is important to have God's word on our heart as he speaks to us and as he guides us and as he cleanses us. When uh, scripture was being read, I, I forgot to grab this last night, so I, I wanted to go grab it today. This, this is my daily planner. Uh, I keep it with me. I look at it every day. I see what I have. I schedule my appointments for the next week. Uh, I do uh, just about everything. I keep notes in here. <laughs> Normally, I, I've cleaned it out recently, but normally it's really thick because I keep so many other things in here. Uh, if anybody wants after the service, uh, you can come and grab just random flyers I have. But there's something important in this book that I keep. And it's to make sure that I have the Word of God on me, and it's to make sure I'm in the Word of God every day. And, and this is a, a just a back and forth sheet. The, the Apostles' Creed and stuff is in here. But on the front of it is Psalm 77. And Psalm 77 is about 20 verses long, and at the end there's a prayer on the back. And uh, nobody will be able to see this because uh, I don't want you to see it because it's very personal stuff that, up here. But, but I have some important dates written up here. And, and they're dates of really good things that have happened in my life. And they're dates of some really bad things that have happened in my life. And it was because I asked a friend to pray for me for something specific. And he told me, read Psalm 77. And I read it and I wept. But I keep it in there so I can remember God's promises. And what I love about the Psalms is they're so relatable. Because in the Psalms, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of emotion. But one thing happens in all these Psalms. God is never uh, forgotten. His power, his majesty, his glory still comes out, even though the psalmist is going through something tough, maybe going through something tough in their life, maybe going through something joyous in their life. I mean, just listen to these words. I cried out to God to, for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. I stretched out my untiring hands. I would not be comforted. I groaned. I meditated. My spirit grew faint. 
Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has God forgotten to be merciful? There's emotion in what the psalmist is writing. But then you flip to the second half of this psalm. I will remember your miracles of long ago. I consider your works and I meditate on your mighty deeds. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. So while you're in your your private sanctuary, find a way to, to be in Scripture. What's great about our cell phones nowadays, we can log on to Bible Gateway or have a Bible app on our phone. Or, or you can be like me, who I just love paper, and this is always with me. My planner throughout the day is on my front seat. And, and there's days that I just sit there and I pull over. I, I have radio, I have Bluetooth, I have all that. There's some days I just turn all that off so I can be in my private sanctuary. And I pull out this and I just read it. Because the psalmist in this psalm has all the emotions that I have. And never forgets who God is either. So while we're in confinement, while we're in a communion, without distraction, then we have to confess something. And sometimes it's confessing where, where we have gone astray, where we've walked away, where our eyes haven't been on the Lord. And other times it's just confessing who God is. Jonah is going to give numerous responses in these 10 verses here. Because in our faith journey, we need the, we need the practice of confession. And, and just look at the intimate language he uses between him and the Lord. You, he's talking about God here, you hurled me into the depths, uh, into the very heart of the seas. Your current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Jonah understood and knew that he was living a life of sin because he took his eyes off of God and he put them on something else. When we confess and when we repent, we, like Jonah, are turning our eyes back to God. He goes on, To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath you barred me in forever, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. That's exactly where Jonah was wanting to go, in the pit, the bottom of the sea. So all those problems would be erased. And yet God says, I still have a plan and I still have a purpose for you. I am not done with you yet. Here is the belly of the fish. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good, and I will say salvation comes from the Lord. If we just offer this lip service to our confession, whether it's confessing our sins or confessing who God is, and we don't act with repentance and we don't act with obedience, there's no change within us. But if we're obedient in our confession, there's change, radical change that happens in our lives. This story is going to continue to be shocking. As God pursues Jonah, even though Jonah messes up, The good news for us, though, is as much as Jonah messes up, God is still there. And as much as we still mess up, God is still there for us. So throughout this week, as we're reflecting, as we're studying uh, Jonah chapter 2, we ought to embrace the moments of confinement. Pockets of isolation and pockets in our private sanctuary is not a bad thing. We need to embrace the moments of communion with our God so that we can confess what we know about ourselves and also what we know about our God. Amen. We're going to enter to a time now of speaking the Apostles' Creed, so I ask that you would please arise as you're able. And in here, we're going to confess about our triune God.